Well, it's good to see you this morning. I have a little public service announcement for you. We are at noon today, officially 12 and a half days away from Christmas. So if my math is right, that is 300 hours away. So for those uh, Christmas shopping procrastinators, I probably just lost you uh, because your mind is thinking about all that you have to do to get ready for Christmas now. Uh, But man, I love this time of year. Christmas is absolutely one of my favorite times of year, as it is probably for many. Um, But one of the reasons I've got to share with you why it's so special for me is because of the three ladies that uh, I live with. Uh, My wife and my two daughters, they are Christmas queens. Um, If if our house is not decorated uh, by the middle of November, um, then it is, it is a crime uh, against humanity. If our Christmas tree is not already up, the Christmas movies start so early in our house. And there are some that I like. There are some that I want to watch. But the ones that I don't want to watch are the ones that are on most of the time. And they tend to come on the Hallmark Channel. And can I just go ahead um, and just say this? I need to get this out and off my chest. I have to do it every few years uh, because it's just, it's in me and I've just got to get it out. If you watch those movies, can I just go ahead and, and give you back some hours in your day? If you've seen one, you've seen everyone. It is the same movie. There's like 437 of those things. There's about 10 actors that are in all of them, and there's like one plot, okay? So I'll just go ahead. I just gave you back hours of your life this Christmas. You don't have to watch those. Watch a good one like Christmas Vacation or, or, or something like that. You know, pick, pick a good one if you're going to watch one. But no, I love it, and, and I kid about that, but, but the thing that just in a fresh new way every year that just captures my heart is when we look at the birth of Christ, amen, Amen. that God himself would come, Emmanuel, God with us. He would wrap himself in flesh, humble himself to be born in a manger for us. That news never gets old. It ought to just hit us fresh and anew each and every year that we look at it. And so that is really why I'm so excited that right now we're going through a series on the I am statements of Jesus. This week, we are on week three of that series. Now, these statements that Jesus said that are recorded in the gospel of John, these statements Listen to this. Jesus is making a declaration in these statements, and you can't miss it. It's there. It's bold. The people listening would have got it. That's why Jesus was going to be stoned for saying it. He, when, he, when he designated himself and he said, I am, he was attaching himself to the great I am that the Jews would have known from Exodus chapter 3, where God reveals himself to Moses as the great I am is how God made himself personal. It's how he showed who he was, his character. And Jesus is saying, I am the I am. Don't miss it. And all through the Old Testament, we see I am. If you are reading through the pages of the Old Testament, every time you see the word Lord in all capital letters, you are seeing this name, I am. Or we would even say Yahweh. It is God's personal name. It is how he reveals his character to us, that he is a provider, that he is a healer, that he is a protector, that he is a redeemer that came to rescue He wanted his people to know him personally. And so he said, I am Yahweh. And then Jesus in the New Testament says, I am. But then he attaches seven metaphors to his name that just give us a glimpse of his saving mission that he came to do 
for you and I. These seven metaphors help us understand what he has come to do. And so we've been looking at them. We saw that he is the bread of life. We've seen that he is the light of the world. Each of these seven statements, it helps to think about them. Maybe like this, they're facets of a diamond. Each way you hold it, the light hits it in a different way, and you're captivated by the beauty of that diamond. Each one is unique. Each one has a brilliance all to its own. But when you put them together, there is this priceless beauty of the object, of the diamond that you're looking at. And that, 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 that is these, these I am statements are this beautiful picture of what this baby that was born in Bethlehem to this teenage virgin poor peasant girl with her carpenter, simple carpenter fiance looking on. This baby that was placed in a feeding trough that had animals and shepherds as the welcoming committee for his birth. It's the great I am. It's the bread of life. It's the light of the world. And today we're gonna see that he is the door for us. So if you have your Bible, I want you to look today at John chapter 10. Just as a side note, in case you haven't ever made the connection, if you look at the stained glass window behind me, you'll see the I am statements there for you. I don't know, maybe, maybe for some of you, you've never noticed that, what that is behind you. You've just thought it's beautiful, but these are the I am statements. Each of those represent one of the statements that we're looking at over these weeks. And so I think it's beautiful as we look at these today, we're moving into John chapter 10 to see this next one, but to understand it, we need to go back to chapter nine and see the events that unfolded, and it really helps us focus in on why Jesus chose this point to reveal himself as the door. So if you will, I'm just gonna summarize chapter nine for you a little bit. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is walking along near the temple, and it says as he passed by in verse one, he saw a man blind from birth. So this man was there, and Jesus saw him, and his disciples asked him a question. It's like, hey, is this guy blind because of sin in his own life or is it sin in his parents' life? And Jesus says, you're looking at this wrong. He said, you're gonna see God's glory through this and his power at work through this situation. It has nothing to do with the sin in either of their lives. And so Jesus, then it says he spit on the ground and he made some mud and he applied it to this man's eyes and he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man did as he was told, and it says he came back seeing. It's an amazing story. Someone who has never seen, now they're seeing for the first time. Everything is now colorful. There's Everything now has shape. It's, It's a whole new world opened up for this man. It ought to have been cause for celebration. But instead, the Pharisees turned this into a debate. They call, they call the man's parents and the man in to say, what's going on here? Because see, see, they're focused on the day in which Jesus chose to perform this miracle. It was the Sabbath. No work was to be done on the Sabbath. So rather rejoicing about the sight that had been given to this man, they want to call Jesus into question and, 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 his, and the family here associated with the man and say, how could you commit this sin And so they call the parents in and say, your son wasn't really blind. That's pretty much what they're implying is he wasn't really blind. This was just a stunt, right? And and his parents are scared. Out of fear of the Pharisees, they won't answer the questions. They don't wanna be kicked out of the temple. They don't don't want to be kicked out of being able to participate in Jewish life. And so they, they clam up and they won't speak. And so they call the man in and he says, listen, I can see. I couldn't before, that's all I know. I'm healed and I know who did it. And he says, he wasn't scared, right? He stands up to the Pharisees 
But then, as he, as he stands up to the Pharisees, there's, there's, there's consequences for that. Um, his bold answer ticks them off, and so they, they banish him from the temple. They kick him out. Jesus hears about this, and he finds the man, and he speaks to him. He reveals himself to him. And this beautiful thing at the end of chapter nine is that the man places his faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. So not only on this day are his physical eyes able to see, but his spiritual eyes have been opened. And he is now able to see clearly who Jesus is. And he places his faith in him. But then Jesus has some very sharp words for the Pharisees, and that's what's in chapter 10, is Jesus focuses in, and with, with laser precision, he condemns the Pharisees because they have caused this spiritual climate, and we see it, we're seeing it in chapter nine, we're seeing the spiritual climate of the day, people are, are spiritually blind, People are, are stumbling around looking for answers, looking to be able to see clearly. And the spiritual leaders, the shepherds of the day, these Pharisees and religious leaders who were supposed to be pointing people to God are instead all about their own gain. They're, they're, they're promoting fear among the people. They're imposing legalism on the people. All of these rules that, and, 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 and additions to the law of Moses, they're, they're imposing all of this upon the people. And then they're twisting the word of God for their own gain, for their own personal profit and ambitions. And there is this climate of people that we would say are lost without a shepherd. And that is what Jesus speaks into. And so Jesus looks at this, and it is in that context that he says, he teaches, and he says what he says in John chapter 10. So we needed to set that up as we look at what's going on here. So if you will, open your Bible, and I wanna read the first 10 verses of John chapter 10 this morning. So follow along as I read. Jesus says, truly, truly, or I tell you the truth, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. So we see set up for us here this, this comparison between the shepherd and the thieves and the robbers. And so you need to understand that because chapter nine, Jesus is referring to the Pharisees. He's saying, you guys are the thieves and the robbers. You are the one trying to steal the sheep. He said, you're not true shepherds because here's what a shepherd does. And he explains that here. And so to really understand this imagery that he's using, I wanna highlight a few words for you here that will just help clarify this and set the stage for what we're gonna spend most of our time looking at this morning. The first word that you'll see in those first five verses is sheepfold. Now, in, in, in the biblical times, in, in the Near East, a sheepfold, the one that's referenced here in these first five verses, this would have, there was a few types of sheepfolds. Some were small, but this is referring to a big one that would have been attached to a community or a village. Multiple flocks of sheep could have been kept at night for safety in this sheepfold. 
Okay, so that's the kind of sheepfold we're looking at here. They would have been taken in there at night after grazing in the pasture all day and along the hillsides. And then at night, the shepherds would lead them to this communal sheepfold. But to get into that sheepfold, there was a door. And it was a small entrance into the sheepfold. The sheep pretty much would have to go through single file to go in to the sheepfold. Now, there would also be, you will see here, Jesus references a gatekeeper. This would have been an under-shepherd. This would have been somebody that shepherds would employ to watch the door to guard the sheepfold at night while they got some sleep. And then they would come back the next day and the gatekeeper would only let the shepherds in to get their flock of sheep. So that's, that's the picture of what Jesus is referring to and the people would have completely got that. They would have known that imagery of that day. And so that's what he's looking at there. But also I want you to notice toward the end of this section here, we see the relationship between a shepherd and his sheep. And this is so important to set up where we're going here. So don't miss what we see here. The behavior of the sheep and the behavior of the shepherd. Do you notice here? Who do sheep respond to? Only their shepherd. It's an amazing thing. A shepherd could walk into this pen or this fold where there are literally hundreds and hundreds of sheep. And the only ones that would respond to a shepherd to come out of the fold and to be led into pasture were the sheep of that shepherd. As he stood there calling to them, the rest of the sheep would have kept their head down and, and not paid any attention. It was only the sheep that belonged to the shepherd that would come out with him. Now, the other thing I see here that's so beautiful that we're gonna look at this morning is that the shepherd called his sheep by name. I was reading this week and looking, looking at it. Shepherds, even if they had hundreds of sheep, each one had a name, right? And, and each name might have been associated with a particular characteristic or physical attribute of the sheep, right? It could have been squeaky or it could have been, you know, long nose or, or you know, funny eyes or whatever it might be. But the shepherds were so intimately acquainted with their sheep that they named them. And as they called them out, they called them by name. That's the relationship we see here. The other thing we see with the shepherd is that he leads the sheep. He doesn't drive them like cattle, but he's out in front, paving the way, removing obstacles, removing dangers, leading his sheep, and it says the sheep follow the shepherd. Do you see this special relationship? That Jesus is saying, this is his desire. This is what he came to accomplish, was to have this kind of relationship with his sheep. And he's saying, but look at what the Pharisees have done. They don't know the sheep. They're not calling the sheep by name. They're not leading the sheep. It's all about their own gain. And Jesus is wanting to clarify to them, this is not what I came to do. This is what I intended to do. This is who I am. But the Pharisees don't get it. We see in verse six, it says it goes right over their head, right? They don't wanna see. I think it's interesting on the heels of the story of the blind man, the ones who are really blind in the story are the Pharisees. They don't know his voice. <laughs> they don't wanna follow the leading of the shepherd. They're following their own way. They're blind and cut off and they don't hear it. So Jesus says again, he explains, but he's not just explaining what he's just said and clarifying. He's also giving us another picture in verses seven through 10. So look along with me here because this sheepfold that he's referencing here in this section, this one would have been a little different. Whereas the one in the first five verses was a big fold with multiple flocks of sheep, this fold is a small one. It might have been out in the pasture where, where stones had been gathered and they just made a pen for safekeeping for nightfall. Or it could have been attached to a home. But the only sheep in this pen, in this fold, were the sheep that belonged to the shepherd. 
So look at it through those eyes as we read what Jesus says here. Verse seven, he makes it so abundantly clear. He says, I am the door of the sheep. Sometimes we read over that and we we focus on the word, just on the word door. But don't miss the little three letter word before it. I am the door. That is, so, that is so important. He doesn't say, I am a door. He says, I am the door. Do you see the exclusivity here of what he's saying? He is the only door into the safety of the sheepfold where there would be protection from the animals or from the thieves and robbers who would want to steal the sheep. He says, I am the only way. I am the only door. And I'm also the only door back out into the pasture where you can be fed and nourished and and find what you need for life. It's a very exclusive claim. He is the only door. And we need to pause for a minute and think about that because in our culture, we don't like the word exclusive. Right, it, it, there's something that just wells up inside of us. We get nervous when, when, we, when we even have to speak sometimes of the claim that Jesus is the only way. Right, because, even it, because we're so conditioned in our society today to not want to make things exclusive. Right, if you, if you look, we don't like absolutes in our world today. Our, our postmodern culture we're encouraged to follow our own paths, right? To follow our own hearts, to figure out our own way on this journey. What are we saying? Everybody's path is just fine, right? Let's not make it exclusive. Let's not make a single way to something, right? Let's, let's not do that because that's offensive and we can't, we can't say that. And so we don't like those exclusive claims in our culture that there could really be just one way. But Jesus says, in fact, I am the door. But you know, it's not just a cultural problem. A few weeks ago, Pastor Jason talked about the state of the church and we were talking about the state of the church in America and you may have, I hope you didn't miss it, but I just wanna refresh your memory about something. He said, this idea of Jesus being the exclusive way to salvation, it's a problem, believing that's a problem in our churches today too. Did you know in our mainline denominations, as many as eight out of 10 People who sit in the pews in the seats of our churches believe that there are multiple ways to God and that Jesus is not the only door. Those are the churchgoers that fight and, 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 and push against this idea that Jesus could be the door. But that's what he's claiming, boldly claiming. And so for the few minutes we have left, I want us to take time to examine this claim of Jesus, that he is the exclusive door. Because I think as we do, we're going to understand that this exclusivity, it is not the result of the pettiness of a distant God who is detached from his people, but this is actually the graciousness of a loving and merciful savior who longs for us to know him personally. So, some things I want us to ask ourselves this morning. When Jesus claims, I am the door, what does the door provide for us as his people? What is he claiming when he says, I am the door? What is it that this door, walking through this way, this exclusive door, what is it that it provides for us? So we're gonna look at three things that it provides. The first thing I want you to see is that the door provides intimacy. If you'll notice the verses in verses three through five, and then Jesus repeats it again in verse eight, what does he say? 
He says that if you enter through the door into the sheepfold or you enter out of the fold and into the pasture, he's saying, I'm the door. You've got to go through me. And he's saying, but when you do, do you see the intimacy there? He says, I know you. I'm calling you. I'm leading you. Psalm 23 is a beautiful place to go to see this intimate relationship between a shepherd and his sheep. And this this shepherd acting as the door, it says he would anoint their head with oil. He would examine each sheep as it goes in and out to see if it needed tending to. He would call them by name. It's this beautiful, intimate picture Jesus is the door. There is intimacy there. It reminds me of a marriage. And and just so happens that last weekend, I was in Tennessee because my younger brother, I have one brother, and my younger brother asked me to officiate their wedding. And so we got to go to East Tennessee and be part of a wedding. And, And And man, we had such a great time doing that. But you know, as I stood there and I led Evan and Michaela as they they said their vows to one another before God, it reminded me of the intimacy of the relationship between a husband and a wife. This commitment to one another, it's exclusive, right? And, And there's a beauty in that exclusiveness, correct? I mean, imagine if they had stood up there and instead of saying, I promise all of my devotion and all of my love to you and you alone, what if they had stood up there and said, yeah, you're pretty good, but I'm gonna look for other options to intimacy too. I'm gonna look for other paths or doors to find what I need because I'm just not convinced you're it. But hey, let's go ahead and stand here and do this anyway. I mean, that would be absurd, right? You see, the picture between a husband and a wife, Jesus uses that picture to say that we, as followers of Jesus, are his bride. Why? Because he knows that what we long for, our deepest desires, and needs can only be found in him. And so he says, do you want intimacy with the creator of the universe, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God? Do you want a relationship with him? Do you want him to know you personally and you to know him? Come through the door. Walk through the door. There aren't multiple ways to it. There's one, but in this one, there is life and closeness and richness of fellowship that we could not have. Jesus is there. He provides for our needs. He is there to satisfy us. He's there to, he is the door for our healing, for our rescue. He fulfills our need to be loved. He is your door to intimacy. So many times, and it's so good that we think of God in a big way, that Jesus, that Jesus is big, he is king, he is Lord, right? He is magnificent, and he is all of those things, which make the fact that he wants to be your door to know him all the more just overwhelming for us to grasp. The door provides intimacy, The door provides something else. The door provides security. Look at verse nine. Jesus spells it out to make sure they don't miss it. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. This is an emphatic statement. He leaves no question about where salvation comes from. He says, it is through me. I am the door to salvation. Church family, we need to stand on that. We don't need to shy away from this claim of Christ that he is the only way to be saved, right? There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. He says, you come through me for salvation. This week, I had a conversation with someone 
in my office who was telling me they, they, were, they, were, they were, you could tell, they, they, were, they were in turmoil, they were wrestling, there was such a battle going on within them, it was evident on their face, and here is why. Because they were, they were, so, they were questioning, they were wondering, have I done enough to be saved? Is this the way to be saved? Is this the way to be saved? Is this the way to be right with God? Have I done what I need to do to know that I am secure? And my heart broke for them because they were looking for all these answers in all these different directions instead of looking to the door. Their salvation was not based on what they could do. Had they done enough good works or was it, did it lie here or did it lie there? It was, it was found in Jesus alone but they were looking in every other direction for it. And my heart broke because I wanted to plead with them. Your security is found in Jesus. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to worry. All you have to do is walk through the door and you will be saved. The thieves and the robbers that he references, they couldn't touch it, right? Do you hear it? It says, hey, my sheep know my voice. The thieves and the robbers may try to lead them away, but my sheep, they're secure. Nothing's gonna be able to touch them. They're mine. And just to make sure they didn't miss it, he says it again later in the chapter in verse 29. Look at what verse 29 says. Jesus says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hands. Do you see the security of the door? The door provides intimacy and the door provides security. And I think it's a beautiful picture that the man who had been blind, who had been healed, who, who put his faith in Jesus, who was cast out of the temple and of being able to participate in temple worship, spiritually, they would have said he's homeless now, right? No. Jesus said, come through the door. He came through the door and he was secure, Amen. right? He was secure, he was held. Nothing could take him out of the Father's hands. Why? Because he had come through the door. He was now secure. He knew the one who didn't just heal his eyes physically, but spiritually. One more thing the door provides that I want us to see. Freedom. You see, one of the reasons we, we, our culture wants to kick against and press against exclusiveness is because they say, well, that's limiting. That's, that's narrow-minded, right? You, you, can't, you can't think that way. But I want you to see that in Jesus saying he is the exclusive door, there's actually a freedom that can only be found by going through that door. Look at what he says at the end of verse nine. After he says, I am the door, anyone who enters by me will be saved. He follows that up and he says, and they will go in and out and find pasture. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but then he says, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. You see, a byproduct of the security that is found through the door is freedom that is found through the door. You see, there's, there's an important picture here that in this smaller sheepfold that I was telling you about where just the sheep of the shepherd would be kept. Do you know what the door was made of typically for these sheepfolds? The shepherd himself. He would lie in the entrance of the fold. Do you see the picture? The sheep couldn't come in without going through the shepherd. They couldn't go out into pasture without going through this shepherd door, the shepherd himself. And that is the claim that Jesus is making. He's saying, if you wanna enter into the security of knowing me, of knowing that I have provided for your greatest need. Your salvation is in me alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. It is not dependent upon your works. 
But what I have done for you, what my finished work for you on the cross, he says, you come through me. He says, but if you want to experience the abundance of that life, of knowing me, and you want to experience all that it means to walk in the spirit and live for Jesus, he says, you gotta come through me. Do you see it? He says, they will go in and out and find pasture. Do you see the freedom there? The sheep don't have to worry. Do I need security? Am I in danger? Well, I'll just follow the shepherd into the fold. Do I need water to drink? Do I need good grass to eat and nourishment? I'll follow the shepherd, right? There is such a freedom when this, the sheep don't have to worry about their own care. Church, do you know that is us? We're just like those sheep. You see, here's the reality for a sheep. They would not survive a day on their own. Sheep are literally the dumbest animals on the planet. They can't feed themselves. They can't care for themselves. They don't know when they're in danger. But you know who does? The shepherd. And that's why he says, I am the door. All you have to do is follow me to come in and out. And in that knowing me, it provides a freedom. You don't have to worry. You don't have to, to dread. You don't have to try to figure it out. All you have to do is follow the shepherd. There is freedom. The door provides intimacy. The door provides security. And the door provides freedom for us. As the children of God, as the sheep of the shepherd. But you know, as I, as I read this passage over the last few weeks, and, and this week I, I was sharing with, with someone today, this passage just really began to wreck me because something I noticed there as I was reading is how many times Jesus talks about the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. You see, there is a very bold, exclusive claim that he is the door. But how do we know where that door is? How do we know how to find it? his voice. He doesn't leave us wondering, guessing, trying to figure it out on our own. It's through recognizing his voice, hearing his voice and responding to it. Do you see how personal that is? It's, it should be overwhelming to us to see that God in his love would choose that way to communicate to us how we can know him. And then I happened this week to come across a video that just, just you know, it just kind of solidified, you know, my, my state of just kind of being a mess. Uh, this one just kind of sent me over the edge. And so I thought I ought to share it with you because if I'm going to be a mess, I'd like for you to be as well with me. Um, so here, check this out real quick. Keep your gloves up, Chip. Keep your hands up. <laughs> Come on, Chip. Come on. So there we go. Daddy? Such a big boy when I was a good one. I am so proud of you. Wow. You still don't keep your guard up when you punch. I love you. 
am so proud of you. You were such a big boy when I was gone. You were such a big boy. Thank you. I love you. You want to play hockey tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This father coming home from deployment. Do you see it? He heard the voice of his father. And he knew it. He knew the voice. And, 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 and when, the, when the blindfolds came off, do you see the response to the voice of the father? The intimacy of the embrace, the security that he felt that his dad was there, right? The freedom that he experienced, right? There, was, there wasn't worry, right? There wasn't dread. There was just the beauty of the moment and the, and the, and the, the presence of being together. And it all was started with the son recognizing the voice of his dad. My sheep hear my voice and they listen. They'll follow. They will come in and out and find pasture. I am the door. Through me, you will have life and have it abundantly. What a savior. What a God. The great I am is our door to life. We don't need another door. <laughs> the exclusivity of this is the most wonderful thing. It is the most wonderful gift that God could have given us to know that there is one way Amen. and that way is enough. Amen. That way gives us life. That all of the substitutes that want to pull and, and try to draw us in and capture our attention, we don't have to worry about them. We can listen intently to the voice of the shepherd saying, I am the door. So this morning, if you're here today as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. If you have heard the voice of the shepherd saying, I am the door, enter through me to be saved, and you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you've surrendered to him, he is the king and the Lord of your life, can I admonish you this morning to continually listen to his voice? Don't be distracted by the trappings of this world, the distractions of this world, but listen intently to him to find pasture in him. It is so easy to get sucked into, into believing the lie that says life can be found in other things besides Jesus. He says, I have come that you have, may have life and have it abundantly. Listen to the voice of the shepherd. By listening to it, by being in his word. This is how we know. This is how we follow his leading in our life for him to lead us in and out wherever he wants to go. The security was found in being with the shepherd. How do we know where the shepherd is leading? By listening to his voice. How do we hear his voice? By reading his word. Church, commit as a new year approaches. Commit to being in his word more than you ever have before. There is intimacy and freedom and security found in his voice and in following him. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never responded to the voice of the shepherd calling you. You've never entered through the door. Can I tell you today, he's calling and if you want to hear his voice, he is speaking to you today. He is the door. You don't have to look any longer. 
for how to have meaning and significance and peace and assurance and security. It is found in one place. And it is through the door of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, if you want to hear the voice of the shepherd, if you want to be part of his fold and follow his voice wherever he leads to come in and out and find pasture, today would be a great day for you to respond to the voice of the shepherd, to enter through the door. Our worship team is gonna come back up and we're gonna have one final song. And if today you want to bow your knee before the God of the universe, acknowledge your sin and confess Jesus Christ as Lord, we're gonna have ministers up front who would love to walk you through how to simply call on the name of Jesus and be saved today. I'm gonna pray for us, and then we're gonna stand and we're gonna sing. This altar is open. If you just wanna come as a believer and say, I just need to lay some things down so that I can more intently listen to his voice. You can use this time. However God is leading, I can't tell you that all I can encourage you to do is respond to his leading. If you wanna come and surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you come. Respond to his voice today. Father, would you take this time, would you take your word, and God, would you do with it what only you can do? We thank you that you are the door to life, to salvation. There is no other, and we need no other. You are enough. And we thank you for that, Lord Jesus, our King, our Savior, our door. In your name, amen.